interesting to look at, I always think. Okay, so last week I went through this slideshow, Can We Trust the Words We Read in the Bible? First week we talked about, you know, when I pick up an English Bible, there's 66 books in it. Why are these books in it? Should there be other books in it? What happened to the other things that are written around the same time as the Bible and those extra biblical things that people talk about, like the Apocrypha, Gnostic Gospels, sometimes you hear those words. That was the first week. Um, then last week we talked more about, okay, now that we've decided the 66 books in my Bible belong in my Bible, how did they actually get to me today from the people who originally wrote them? Like Paul, Peter, James, they're writing their letters. How did we get them? And so that's what we talked about last week. And so this week we'll talk more about that process and what that looked like in greater depth. Um, kind of do a little bit of a review. Let me think. Going in this here last week, right? I would, yes. Going in this here last week. Okay. So the first thing I have, yep, there's fire on the list. There we go. I'm going to hand you guys an um, interview that you guys can read on your own time. I thought it was really fascinating. I'll talk a little bit more about it. It's uh, five pages. But you can read this on your own. It'll make more sense in a bit. So some review of the slideshow we went over. We read some quotes. Essentially, the reason I want to do this class is to build up our confidence in the Bible. And so when atheists, unbelievers, even sometimes Christians say things that are like, hey, that's concerning. They're trying to discredit the Bible. What is our response? How can we respond? So one thing that happened in society was Dan Brown authored the Da Vinci Code. It's a fictional book, but many people read it and they think, He's kind of got a good point. You know, what about the Bible? It seems mysterious. What about the whole Catholic Church and what did they do to Scripture? And so they kind of buy into the things that he's saying. We read that quote basically saying that the Bible was hopelessly corrupt. How can you trust it, you know, with the whole process of getting it? Now, Dan Brown is not a biblical scholar in any fashion. This man, though, that published this book, Bart Ehrman, is a biblical scholar. He started out as a Christian, evangelical teaching in a seminary, but through the course of his studies in life, he's now become an agnostic, and he goes kind of out of his way to try and discredit the Bible. He published this uh, book called Misquoting Jesus that became a New York Times bestseller because it's very catching. You know, it's eye-popping. Like, misquoting Jesus. Well, I'm going to read that. Who misquoted Jesus and this other stuff? And he makes this point that essentially there's 400,000 variants between the manuscripts of the, uh, the Bible that we have, especially the New Testament. And the last point that he makes is there are more variations among our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. And if you think about that point, it's kind of alarming because if there's more variations, which a variation is essentially a difference or an error even. And so if there is an error or a difference for each one of the words that we have in our New Testament, well, why would I believe anything I read in the New Testament, right? So a lot of people get deceived by this thinking. Now we have some quick details. The Old Testament uh, was written in Hebrew, and there's an accepted form of the Old Testament called the Masoretic Text, the MT. That's oftentimes what you'll see or read. Now, when people, atheists and others, are attacking the credibility of Scripture, they rarely ever go after the Old Testament because it's very hard to do. There's essentially no case to be made there. Now, they will go after the New Testament because there's a lot more of a case to be made. So that's the Old Testament, the Masoretic text. By the time Jesus, his disciples, got around, Greek was the common language, and the Old Testament had been translated into Greek as well. So many of them were reading in Greek. They knew the verses in Greek. Uh, if you're looking at the New Testament where Jesus quotes a verse, maybe Psalms you know, 105, 1 or something, and you go from the New Testament where he quotes it to the actual verse in the Old Testament, you might even notice a word or two is different, or a different order or something. And you're like, why is that? If he's literally quoting this verse, well, he's quoting it in Greek. So he's quoting it just a little bit different. Now, the Greek version of the Old Testament is called the Septuagint. The LXX, the Roman numerals there, means 70. It took 70 different guys to translate this and put it together. That's just another thing to know. Uh, Hebrew and Greek, very different from languages today. So it's a difficult thing to study. Lots of differences there. We talked about this last week. These are some examples especially the Old Testament scrolls. So Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they might be written on stuff like this, dried out animal skin, where it's a whole scroll. It's not the book form that we have today. And so if you want to open up to Isaiah or whatever, you have to unroll the whole thing, and you can even see how long some of these might get and just how difficult it is for them to survive because of the conditions they're in for thousands of years. We talked about those. As the New Testament got around and was started 
being written. This is kind of more of what the New Testament manuscripts would look like. This is written on papyrus, and so when we find these, we give them names, we designate them as papyri, and you put a number next to it, so papyri 52 or 48 or 66. And a lot of times they're fragments. So I think this one was actually, yeah, this is Exodus 15 in particular, but oftentimes it's a chapter, it's not the whole collection, so you have these fragments. Now, whole collections are also found, and they're really valuable for us when we find a whole entire uh, manuscript of the Bible. This one is on display in the Vatican. If you ever go and see the Pope, you might find this. It's called Codex Vaticanus. Uh, Codex in Latin just means book, and they assign whatever name, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, Alexandrius, based on where it's found, that type of thing. We talked about the process of copying manuscripts. Obviously, the original is written, so Paul, Peter, whoever, writes his original, and it's made copies of. And I used the example of I wrote a sentence on the board, and I had each of you guys made a copy of it. And yeah, last week there were seven of you. So the sentence was, I like to sing Christmas songs. And Aspen, I put, took him in particular, he had his copy, and I said, Aspen, if you misspelled the word Christmas in your copy, now your copy, called a manuscript, has an error in it. It's got a variation, it's got a variant from the original. So that's how this idea of error, errors, variance works. But with that, his error, maybe he just misspelled Christmas, that's not a very big deal, right? And especially when you have other manuscripts to compare it to, you can understand the original has the word Christmas and it's spelled correctly. And so when you read a manuscript where there's a spelling error, a grammatical error, you can easily fix those things and not be worried about those things. That was a lot of what we talked about last week. But in the New Testament, there's other types of errors. And so what do you do with those errors? Now, I talked a little bit about this, textual families. When we're talking about the New Testament in particular, someone makes a copy, they make a copy, they make a copy. Oftentimes those copies are grouped together in textual families. There's essentially three recognized families in this science of New, Text New Testament textual criticism. Uh, Western and Caesarean is sometimes split into four. And these families are essentially, they're the style that they're written in, the style that they're copied in. And often they're very geographical. So Alexandria is famous for what? What was Alexandria famous for in antiquity? The library. the library of Alexandria. Alexandria was a hub of knowledge, learning, academia at this time. And so the Alexandrian family actually is the most reputable, the highest quality family that we have manuscripts from. And that makes a difference because the Alexandrian manuscripts, when you come across them, they have less variance just per manuscript than other manuscripts have. The Byzantine family, Byzantine was a city uh, kind of Eastern Europe, that Eastern Europe, Turkey, that becomes the center of uh, the Holy Roman Empire at the time, where it kind of turns into two. And so Byzantine becomes famous because that's essentially where they start copying a lot of these manuscripts, and they produce a ton of them. The majority of the manuscripts we have are from the Byzantine family. But the issue is their manuscripts are of a little bit less quality. There's just a little bit more errors, variance per manuscript than you'd want to see. And so when we're talking about manuscripts, the Alexandrian are of the highest quality. That makes a difference because if you open your Bible, often you can just go to a random spot in the New Testament, and you find a footnote, and you see down the bottom of the page what the footnote says, and it tells you, like, another reading for this, or it just says, or this, and it gives you the reading, and then it gives you after the reading, it'll say something like, oldest manuscripts don't have this, earliest manuscripts don't have this, late manuscripts don't have this, better manuscripts don't have this, some type of reading like that. Well, that's what it's talking about. So one reading might be from the Byzantine family, it has this inserted, but then we find Alexandrian manuscripts that say, well, maybe that wasn't in the original wording of the New Testament. And after uh, all the decisions are made and the evidence is weighed, we can put out our English translations that say, okay, that likely wasn't in the original. Let's no longer have that in there. We talked about families. We talked about finding manuscripts. So finding manuscripts is a really weird and difficult thing to do. And that's what the interview that I gave some of you guys is for. I got to print off a few more of those. Um, the interview there is with Daniel Wallace. He's a very famous New Testament scholar, and he goes around 
um, finding manuscripts, essentially. He's got a team. He leads the Center for New Testament Studies, is what it's called. And so they go all over the world taking high-resolution pictures of these manuscripts, some of these examples that I showed you, and digitizing them and giving us a library to be able to study them. So this thing is very fragile. We don't want a lot of people touching it, handling it, working with it. And so his team go around and they take these digital pho photographs, but they can even enlarge them, grow them, so then you can see them in really good detail. Wow. The interview I gave you is going to be very helpful. But um, one of the examples I had was his team went to Albania. Albania, after the Cold War, sides with Russia. So America, Russia, don't get along. America, Albania, we're not really allowed in Albania. Albania has a number of New Testament manuscripts that they're aware of and that they know of, but because of their limits in the studies that they have, they weren't able to say, like, this is John or this is Paul or whatever writing this. And so at a certain point, I think it was maybe 2008, 2013, they finally allowed Daniel Wallace and his team to come into the country and to photograph and digitize these manuscripts that they had and tell us, okay, this discovery is now public to the world. This is what Albania has had for the last thousand years or however long, however long they've had it. So the whole idea of manuscripts is that when they're copied, oftentimes they're hidden, they're lost for a certain amount of time, and we're still finding and cataloging them today. So even though the copying process is done because we have our Bibles now, we don't need people literally hand copying them, we're still finding and categorizing manuscripts today. More evidence is still coming out. And that leads us to get better and better versions of these, what I handed to Dan here, are Greek New Testaments. Okay, now back in the just for a sec. So these are two Greek New Testaments. Now, if you're going to publish an English translation, the best thing to do is go back to the original language. You don't want to publish from Latin to English because that's a horrible mess. King James had that. So you go to a Greek New Testament, and then you translate to English. But these are getting revised as well for more and more evidence that continues to come out. I think this one's the second edition. This one's the fourth edition. So there's little differences as we find more and more manuscripts that give us better confidence, different errors or variants that we find, just different things. And so the better versions are able to be published. And so now I'm handing back out, and you can look through those if you want. They're kind of interesting just to see what it looks like. But we're getting better and better versions all the time. We talked about why does this matter. The original King James 1611 was published. Oftentimes they translated from Latin to English. And so you're going through three languages and you're, it's very hard to keep the original wording. And so one of the issues that they actually had was this word called Holy Ghost. Now who remembers reading your Bible as a kid and seeing Holy Ghost and you memorize verses with Holy Ghost. The issue is that's not in the Bible. Okay? Holy Ghost is not in the Bible because the Greek does not have that. It has Holy Spirit, but when Spirit from Greek got translated to Latin, they used the word phosmos, which then translates to English as phantom or ghost. So that's where we get Holy Ghost from, through a three-language translation. That's why we don't want to do this. We avoid this. Now, we talked about some examples, difficulties in translating. Most of us here only speak one language, but for those who speak two, you can see, now if I'm talking to someone in Spanish and I want to know what their name is, I'll say, como te llamas, and then they would tell me whatever their name is. Now if I'm translating to someone in English, because they're hearing the conversation, not understanding what's going on, they're like, hey, what did you just say? I would say to them, well, I asked him what, what was his name. But it, the words are literally translated as, how are you called? So every translator, when they're going from one language to the next, has to make decisions. How do I translate this? What is the best way to translate this? Because it makes a difference. Do I just translate, well, these are what these words meant, or do I translate, well, this is what was actually said. This is how they received it, the audience. Another example of just how grammar worked, el gato negro would be the correct way to say it. But in English, we wouldn't say the cat black we would just simply say the black cat because our grammar works different for our language. Hebrew and Greek grammar, crazy. Um, another one is cultural sayings. Pura Vida is a cultural saying, especially for Costa Rica. Um, it means a lot there. You can use it in a lot of different ways. It can kind of be a greeting, a salutation, a, rec a recognition that someone said something to you and you just say Pura Vida back. But it can mean more than that. And so I think for us, I put this in, you know, how many of us have seen those commercials where it's showing the lakeshore and all the different beaches we have, and then it ends with pure Michigan. 
And you're like, yeah, Pure Michigan. Because we live here and we understand that Michigan, even though we have a lot of bad things like winter and potholes, we have a lot of good things <laughs> like the Great Lakes and the beaches and the beauty of Michigan. So we understand when someone says, Pure Michigan, yeah, Pure Michigan. There's cultural sayings. There's cultural sayings for Jesus and his followers in Greek during that time. And you have to recognize those if you're translating. Well, the words just mean pure life, pura vida. That's what it means. But it means so much more than that. So there's a lot of different things with translating that make it difficult. And then we talked about this, kind of the bread and butter of New Testament studies. How many manuscripts are there? This is an important thing. Now, currently, we have been able to find and categorize, catalog, more than 25,000 either complete or partial manuscripts. So Paul writes the book of the Ephesians. They make copies. Some of those copies are found complete. It's got the whole thing. Other of those copies are found. There's only a few verses. There's only a few pages, a few chapters of it. So complete and partial. We're finding both of these. Now, of those, the languages make a difference. There's about 5,800 in Greek. There's about 10,000 in Latin. And there's about 9,300 in the other languages combined. Uh, Egyptian, Syriac, Coptic, um, Gregorian. There's a bunch of different languages. Now, the Greek is the biggest one that we focus on because, of course, that's the original language. So that makes more of a difference to us. But it's awful, also helpful to see the other languages, how, it was, how these words were translated um, and the different process. Now, you see the, the majority is in Latin. And I talked about the textual families. The Byzantine, they wrote their copies in Latin. So you have the majority of them written there in Byzantine because they're able to do that. Um, a good question to ask, how does this compare to other writings during these times? Other writings from antiquity, right? Because we didn't live 2,000 years ago, so we don't understand this a lot. Well, Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey, very famous writings. You might study them in high school. Does anyone ever question, did Homer actually write these words? Are these the words of Homer's Iliad or Homer's Odyssey? Or did they get changed through the thousand years that they had to get copied? No, no one's ever posed that question because no one cares. But the difference is his uh, writings here, both of them combined, only have about a thousand manuscripts that have been able to be found and categorized and cataloged. So you have a thousand versus 25,000 and you see the mountain of evidence that there is for the New Testament in particular, not even the Old Testament, just the New Testament here. So the New Testament is overwhelmingly documented and preserved compared to any and every other document from antiquity. The fact that we know people lived 2,000 years ago, like Nero, Trajan, these other emperors, there's only a limited amount of sources that even put them as a real person and put them as doing these things. And yet the sources and evidence that we have for Jesus as a real person, his disciples as a real person, and these events actually happening is just incomparable compared to the other sources. And so that's something that I want to drive home as well. Now, we talked a little bit about variants. We did the, the copy there. The important thing here is that what is a variant? And so the I showed at the beginning here a, a quote from a New Testament scholar, Bart Ehrman, who said he's essentially trying to attack the Bible. He said that there's essentially 400,000 variants or errors, differences, what that word means, in the New Testament alone. Now, let me get some more handouts. Jackie, that's for you, one for you, one for Neil there. And uh, here, one for you, one for Neil from the last few weeks. Thank you. Corey, I'll get you done in a sec. But essentially, you might hear that and think, okay, what can I trust in the New Testament? Because there's only about 140,000 words in the New Testament. So if there's one, ver one error or variant per word, that seems very unreliable. But that's not what the actual picture is. Most of the variants are due to spelling and grammar, and those are easy fixes, like we talked about with Aspen. If I write a sentence up on the board, I have each of you 12 guys copy that. Now you have 12 manuscripts of the original, but if one of you guys spells the word Christmas wrong or one of you spells a different word wrong, that's an error, that's a variant, compared to the other manuscripts and compared to the original. We all know spelling, you know, it happens if someone's copying, and I talked about the process of copying too last week, very difficult stuff. You know, if you come across these errors, you can easily recognize those. Those are recognizable, they're fixable, no issue. That's the majority of the 400,000 variants. Now, what are the other variants? Well, before I get there, let's do some math. 
if there's 400,000 variants across 25,000 manuscripts, then that means there's only 16 variants per, but the issue is you can't just do a generalization with these things because some manuscripts are very large versus other manuscripts that are just a portion. Uh, if the more conservative estimate of only 200,000 variants, then it's only eight variants per, but there's groupings of variants that contain the majority. See, only about five to six percent of the New Testament contains the majority of the variants, and we're going to look at those today. The UBS, the Greek New Testaments that I have around, that's the UBS, it only includes 1,400 textual footnotes. Now, if you think about the large number of 200,000 variants, well, the Greek, which is for scholars on the highest level to be able to look at these things and analyze which reading is right, this one or that one, the Greek only gives you 1,400 footnotes. And it gives you all the different evidence for why it might be this translation versus that translation. So if the Greek narrows it down that much for the highest level, the English, if you just pick up a, a normal English translation and you go to the New Testament and you look through all the different footnotes that you find at the bottom, you're only going to find about 200 to 300 of these footnotes where it says something like, this verse could read this, and it just changes a word or it changes the order or something. So there's really not that many variants. Now there's two sections in the whole New Testament where more than two verses are in dispute, and those two sections, you might already be aware of these, John 7, 53 to 8, 11, the story of the woman called adultery, and Mark 16, 9 to 20. So open up, if you have a Bible, to John 7. We'll look at this real quick. And hopefully you've come across this before. You've interacted with it in your Bible, and you've come across it, and you see something that gets your attention. So as you open up to this, does anybody have something before this section starts in your Bible? What does it say there on the page? The woman caught in adultery. The woman caught in adultery. There's no brackets or anything. There's, There's a bracket around verse 53. It mm -hmm. says, everyone went to his home. There's only a bracket home? on this side. Right. There's nothing on this side. It says that ancient Greek manuscripts don't include oh, yeah. these verses. There you go. So Dan's Bible. Yeah. Mine starts with, before it even gets there, maybe you can see that, there's a big line, and it tells you right at the beginning, the earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses do not have this section. A few manuscripts include these verses wholly or in part, and then it even gives you a bunch of places where it includes it, because often those manuscripts don't even put it at this section in the narrative. It puts it at a different chapter in John. Some of them even put it in Luke. So if you read through this, you know, you can read through the story. It's, you know, the woman's called adultery. The Pharisees want a stone her. Jesus says, you know, he who is without sin casts the first stone, right? And essentially they leave. And the woman says they've all left. And he says, they don't condemn you. I don't condemn you either. She leaves. You can read through the story, and there's nothing concerning. There's no theological error or just really alarming thing that you might think, that doesn't sound like something Jesus would say. It seems to fit Jesus' character, how he interacts with people. So there's kind of no issue there. But the issue is that, in, I'm losing the word now, integrity. For the integrity of the New Testament, if we believe that the New Testament and whole Bible is God's very words to us, then we want to make sure that what we are reading is actually what God wants us to read, is God's word, and is not someone later on inserting something into Scripture that was not there originally. Okay? So we want to have integrity in our Scriptures. And so you can read through this and say, well, there's nothing concerning there, but the problem is when we find all the evidence that comes out, the evidence overwhelmingly says this is likely not in Scripture. This was not in the original Gospel of Luke. I'm sorry, Gospel of John. Gospel of John. And so then the question is for English translators, because this has been in our Bibles for hundreds of years, what do we do with it? Because if you just take it out, there's going to be people who say, what happened to that verse? You know, what happened to these verses? What happened to that chapter? So then they say, okay, well, since there's no issue with it, we'll leave it, but we're going to alert people, right? We're going to warn them this is likely not in the original Bible, and there's manuscript evidence for this. There's all these different arguments you can make about if it shouldn't be there or if it should. Now, this section, I don't know how many verses it is, 12 maybe? The 12 verses right here contain the majority of the errors, the variants, that word, for the New Testament. And so the errors don't appear, you know, in an average way. They appear in groupings. Because this, 
John 7 here was added afterwards, it was added in many different ways, and scholars disagreed with it, and so they interacted with it, and all these errors pop up from this one place. Yes. And is that account in any of the other Gospels? No, this one is not an account okay. in any of the other Gospels either. So this one and the other one, Mark 16, which maybe you've read that one as well. We can turn there too, and we'll see what our Bibles say about it. These two sections account for the majority of the errors or the variants that we find in all of the New Testament manuscripts. Hmm. It's not just evenly spread out through all the 140,000 words in the New Testament. So you get to the ending of Mark, and Mark has uh, the crucifixion of Jesus, and then he has an interesting resurrection account where we don't actually get Jesus appearing to anybody or saying anything. It's simply the empty tomb. Uh, I believe Mary and Martha, maybe just Mary, goes there and sees it. And then, you know, the random gardener says to him, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus. And the women go away trembling and bewildered. Now, if you're a Christian, early times, you're reading Mark's gospel, you might be like, but where's Jesus? You know, where's the resurrection? Where's the account where he's appearing to Peter or these other people? Why would Mark simply just leave his gospel off with these women found the empty tomb and went away trembling and bewildered? <laughs> Interesting. So a scholar, you might think, well, Mark, he meant something more, right? There's got to be something more here. And that's where you get the extended ending, the extended edition of Mark. And so you can see that same warning that I have from John 7. Yep. Hopefully you see that same warning in your Bibles when you open up that tells you, the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 to 20. And then it gives you the verses. Mine even, they're just different, they're italics versus the rest of Scripture. These two sections, these 11 verses, the other 12, contain the majority of the variants and disputes that there are in the New Testament. And this one in particular, you know, we looked at John 7, really wasn't any issue because it seems to fit Jesus' character. There's nothing out of line. But this one in particular, as you read through it, there's a section where he appears to his disciples and he tells them, he said to them, verse 15, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. Good. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. All these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new languages. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, they will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people. And after they will get well. Hmm. Does that sound concerning? Is that a teaching we believe in the New Testament that we will be doing these things? Picking up snakes and we will not, you know, die when it bites us. Drinking poison and it will not harm us. These things are an issue. And there's actually churches in America, churches around the world that believe in snake handling. It's still a thing here in America. I think in Virginia, maybe. Kentucky. Kentucky, yeah. Blame it on them, right? <laughs> West Virginia. West Virginia. West Virginia. So, this is an issue because if Mark 16, 9 to 20 is in your Bible, it's inspired by God, right? This is God's word. So you have to believe. You have to do. You have to teach these things. But this is not actually God's word. It's not actually in the original that Mark wrote to the believers. It was simply added later on. And the best manuscripts, the earliest manuscripts, ancient witnesses, the evidence we have says this is not in the original Bible. But again, you know, it's been there for hundreds of years. Do we simply just get rid of it? And then people are, you know, it's more of a conspiracy theory. Well, we'll put it in there and we'll warn people. This is likely not in the original Bible. Take it as you will. Take it with a grain of salt. Any questions about those two? You got any idea who wrote those and why they're in here to be in them? Hmm. I don't know where these two originated. That's a good question. Yeah, because... Uh... Evidently, the original manuscripts don't have them, so who, mm -hmm. wrote, who wrote these, those two sections? Yeah, that's a good question. There is an example that I brought up earlier about Erasmus. Not that one. So, I gave you guys the Greek New Testaments there. Erasmus is a famous scholar from the 1500s who was trying to put together a Greek New Testament. To this point, they didn't have a authorized or accepted version of a Greek New Testament. And so it was, you know, this region has these manuscripts, this region's got these manuscripts. So he's trying to put together, do the work of putting together a New Testament. And he called it the Textus Receptus, 
received text. Um, he, <laughs> so he, just like the one you have in front of you, made multiple editions, multiple versions of it, right? The first one he published, 1516, but later on, as he did more editions, because more manuscripts were found, more evidence, that type of stuff, the Catholic Church actually come to him and tell him the verse in the first in First John 5, 7 there, where it talks about these three testify, the spirit, the water, that one, you can kind of read it, and your Bible will have a footnote there. The Catholic Church wanted him to insert a sentence adding um, evidence for the Trinity. And so he's like, okay, finally, after all the, you know, uh, I lost my word. After all the persuasion that they did to him, he added it. It was not originally there. And we can actually find this as scholars and go back to it and say, okay, this is when this verse enters scripture. Because he's using Greek manuscripts and only the Latin manuscripts had it at that point. And so he's saying, the earliest manuscripts don't have it. It was added later on. I shouldn't include it, but they convinced him to include it. That's a fascinating one. But I gotta keep going. Okay, the questionable verses. I do have it on here as well. Good thing you're looking at it. I talked about it last week. So the question that I asked then, these two in particular are 12 verses about. They contain the majority of the variants, the errors we see. If we lost these two, you know, what are we missing? Well, we might lose an example of Jesus interacting with a woman in adultery. We might lose an example of God's grace. This other one, we might lose an example of uh, Jesus appearing, the resurrection to believers, and some evidence for his resurrection. But the problem is we don't lose anything with these because we have all the other scriptures that testify to Jesus' character, that his grace and his other things, and his resurrection. You don't need these things, and especially if the evidence tells us this is likely not the original scripture, then as you know, believers, for the integrity of God's word, we should, okay, believe the evidence that's there and say, if these aren't in scripture, I'm not going to treat them as scripture anymore. You know, they're just interesting, interesting different things we can read, especially the first John one. This one, some people might argue, you would lose an evidence for the Trinity, but you don't need this verse as an evidence for the Trinity. If you look throughout the New Testament, there is a plethora of different verses you can find for evidence of the Trinity. We don't need this. So what are some other interesting footnotes? Now, the first point in the rest of the New Testament, there are only two dozen footnotes that affect one to two verses. So I started by saying there's two places in the New Testament where more than two verses are in question. That's the John 7 and the Mark 16. Now as you get smaller, there's about 24 places where one to two verses are in question. Everything else is less than a complete verse that's even in question. And those are the majority that you see when you open up your Bible and it says to you, or this word. And it literally just changes one word and they're basically the same thing. And so you look at it and you're like, that doesn't even seem like it does anything, right? You've probably come across those types of footnotes. So what about some of the other interesting footnotes, right? We'll go to Matthew 6, 13. Matthew 6, 13. I gotta print some stuff as you guys are going there. Corey, when you get there, can you read Matthew 6, 13? The footnote that's there? You need to go get it off the printer? Oh, uh, yeah, that'd be great. So let me go. The footnote on Matthew 6.13? Yep. So as you're just reading scripture, there is no Matthew 6.13, right? As you're just reading it, you're like, it's not there. It says verse 13, but there's nothing there. So then you go to the footnote. And my footnote says, some manuscripts add, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. So this is the Lord's Prayer, right? How many of you guys memorized the Lord's Prayer as a child? Probably still know it today. In King James. In King James, right? The only authorized translation. And you say it, but nowadays there's less of the Lord's Prayer. The ending gets cut off, right? And you're like, what happened to that? Why did that happen? Well, you can read the footnote. The earliest manuscripts don't have this in the Lord's Prayer. So what happened there? A scholar along the way, you know, reading through the Lord's Prayer, decided at some point the ending just doesn't fit right. You know, it seems that there should be more of a praise to God ending, so let me throw this in. And I think he actually quotes from another place in Scripture with that ending. I can't remember exactly where it's from right now. But it's, the ending is not anything controversial, right? All glory and honor and praise to God, no issue. 
The issue is that this is not in the original scripture. So we should no longer treat it as the original scripture in this spot. Okay? I haven't said anything yet, so hold on. <laughs> yes. Okay. So how many people did I give the interview to? There was five of you, right? Yeah. So one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Give me those. So when we come across a footnote like that, our reaction should be, okay, interesting. Thank you for alerting me to this. This is not likely in the original scripture, so I don't need to treat it like it's scripture in any sort of way. You know, it's fine for people to still memorize the Lord's Prayer and memorize it with the extended position, but that's not actual scripture. It's not teaching anything contrary to scripture, so no problem, but just something to be aware of. Um, let me see, I want this one too. Going no over here, nothing, okay. Just printing off some more things. The front and back too. All right, John. Yeah. They should be ready. All right, bring this back though. From current slide. Okay, another one that's interesting. Mark one forty one. Let's go there. Oh, did you hit right now? I did. Oh. Mark one forty one. This is another one of the interesting footnotes. That's more than just a simple verse. All right, it is getting hot in here. You're just busy. <laughs> so, the story is Jesus heals a man with leprosy. It starts even in verse 40. A man with leprosy, who's got a footnote above the word leprosy? Aspen's got one, the little letter A, right? Mm -hmm. For most people. So then you go down to the end there, and it says, verse 40, footnote 8, the Greek word traditionally translated leprosy was used for various diseases affecting the skin. So this is one of those that's not actually a manuscript error or variant thing. It's just simply your Bible translators giving you some additional information here. The word leprosy likely meant more than just the skin disease that we think of where they're falling apart. So it's not an error or variant. It's additional information. But you continue... A uh, man with leprosy came to him, begged him on his knees. If you're willing, you can make me clean. Verse 41, Jesus was indignant. Does anybody's verse read in a different way? There's a footnote that says, Many manuscripts Jesus was filled with compassion. So there's a footnote. Many manuscripts say, Jesus was filled with compassion. Does that say that? Yeah. Does yours translation say compassion, or is it the footnote? It says compassion. Okay, so good. Which uh, translation do you have, Jackie? New King James. New King James. Mm -hmm. ah. I have the New American Standard. New American Standard. So, what's going on here? That seems to be two different sentences, right? Jesus sees a man with leprosy, yeah. mm -hmm. and the options are he's indignant or he's moved with compassion. Those seem like opposite ends of the spectrum. Huh. You talk about a footnote that makes a difference. This one seems to make a difference, right? That's not one of those options versus the word saying God versus the word saying Lord. Like, those are the same thing. So, what's going on here? He reached out his hand, touched the man, and said, I am willing, he said, be clean. Well, as you look at this, the Greek here reads it as uh, Jesus had compassion is in the majority of the Greek manuscripts. But, um, sorry, it was the other way around. Jesus was indignant is in the majority of the Greek manuscripts. But as you read that in English, you're like, that doesn't make sense. Why would Jesus be indignant at this man for having leprosy? But the issue is that he's not indignant at the man for having leprosy. He's indignant at the situation happening. And he has compassion. That's something he has. But that's not what the verse actually reads. And so this is an example of a scholar not inserting something, but changing something for an easier reading. Now, I talked about last week, in the science of New Testament textual criticism, looking at the manuscripts, determining which is the original reading, there is different rules. There's rules that you actually follow. So if you have two manuscripts that you're comparing to each other, you would note a number of things. Typically, the earlier manuscript is the better one, right? Something that we find written in the hundreds is something better than we find written in the 1400s. That makes sense. Now, however, that's not the only criteria. And just because something's earlier doesn't mean that we go with that reading versus the older reading. There's the textual families that I talked about. Alexandrian versus Byzantine and Western. The regions that you find the manuscript make a difference. 
But inside of the manuscript, there's also criteria. One of those criteria is the more difficult reading is typically the actual reading. The more difficult the reading is in the manuscript, the more likely that's the actual reading in the manuscript. The different ways that manuscripts get changed, they're more likely changed to make them easier to read. Scholars will change or add things because the reading to them doesn't make sense. Why would Jesus be indignant? That doesn't make sense. Maybe they meant compassion. Maybe they meant something else, right? <clears throat> so in manuscripts, in the science of it, the more difficult the reading, typically that's the better reading because we change things to make them make more sense. And <clears throat> it makes sense when we think about the languages that I put up here earlier, the examples, we change the translation to make more sense. Because if I say, como te llamas, and I tell you, how are you called in English, it doesn't make any sense. Why would you translate it like that? So that's an example of how... I would answer mom. <laughs> yeah, mom. I wouldn't say my name, right? Yeah. yeah. That's an example of how in the manuscripts, you can see which one's better versus which one is worse, and how they got changed, and why they got changed over time. Does the word indignant that is translated mean something different then than what it does to us now because we're reading yep. things through our filter yep through and the how we use the word mm -hmm. is, is that could that be it so this one indignant does mean the same indignant okay. feeling that we have today there are other ones like even john used this morning the word flesh <clears throat> you know we would think of just flesh but the greek had a more um self-sufficient living <clears throat> or just fleshly desires interpretation connotation to it okay. So that's one of those Greek words that does make more of a difference. This is one where they just decided, doesn't make much sense, let's change it, right? But the better manuscripts that we find give us the better evidence, and we can decide, okay, the original reading was this. Now in all these footnotes that I'm going over, I hope you see the reason we have this study, this science of New Testament textual criticism is for the integrity of God's word. We want to be sure that what we're reading is the original as God intended it, as Paul, Peter, James, whoever wrote it to us, and that there's nothing added, there's nothing lost, it's what they have. Now, we're not interested in removing text, rather, we're interested in restoring the original writing. That's a, a key difference here. Some atheists, other people will argue Christians are removing scripture, they're removing text, they're removing God's word or deleting it for whatever reason. That's not what we're doing, we're restoring the original. That's good. Okay, now ending statement, no orthodox doctrine or ethical practice of Christianity depends solely on any disputed wording. It's kind of a lot there. The variance problem I talked about, the different variants, the, the footnotes that you can go and find in your New Testament. If we just took out every verse that's got a footnote in it, we would not lose any of the theological teachings or practices that we have today. Nothing that we rely on is built upon something that we're not sure of. Okay, that's that point. We can trust when we pick up a Bible, we are reading God's Word. Because of the wealth of manuscripts available today and advancements in textual criticism and technology, we are overwhelmingly confident in the words of Scripture. That's what I want to drive home. Uh, next week, I want to actually look at the English translations that we have, which ones are better, which ones are worse, why are there so many English translations, that type of thing. That will be next week. Now, the last thing I want to end with, I started this slideshow with a quote from Bart Ehrman. He's a New Testament scholar, and he says that essentially uh, the New Testament has more variance per words, and so it's hopelessly corrupt. But in his own book that he says that, on the back of it, he says this bottom one, and these are other quotes that he's made in his career when he's asked, because he started as a Christian, he turned into an agnostic. He says, textual scholars have enjoyed reasonable success at establishing to the best of their abilities the original text of the New Testament. Indeed, barring extraordinary uh, circumstances, new discoveries, or phenomenal alterations of method, how they do the study that they do, it is virtually inconceivable that the character of our printed New Testament will ever change significantly. That's a very confident saying from him who's trying to undermine the authority of Scripture. And then the bottom, I love this. Essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. So, he's a guy that started this thing by saying this. By saying that one. 
But yet he recognizes that because of all the evidence that we have for the New Testament, the studies that we have, the text, the um, technology, we can be confident that we pick up an English, let alone a Greek New Testament, this is the original wording to the best of our abilities. There's another place where I think in the interview I'm going to give some of you guys here, um, he's asked Daniel Wallace, if we lost the New Testament, the Greek New Testament, and our English Bibles, <laughs> Would we be able to recompile all the New Testament? And you might be wondering how would that be even possible. After the disciples, the church tradition goes to the church fathers. That's the next big name. After the disciples, apostles, you get church fathers. These are guys who were mentored, studied with, did things with actual disciples, and then uh, so on down. They quote the New Testament at an incredible rate. They quote it as, this is God's word, and then they quote it. So just from the New Testament writings from the church fathers, we can compile about 99% of the New Testament. If we lost all of the manuscripts that we have, if we lost all the English, Greek, all the other languages we have, we would still be able to find the New Testament in just their writings alone. So it's incredible when you actually go into this study, the New Testament is so overwhelmingly confident that there's no issue. Bart Ehrman, in his book, he doesn't bring up anything new. He doesn't bring up anything that he discovered. He brings up things that are in the study that people are talking about and discussing that they know about and they're aware of. But he just uh, packages it, markets it in an enticing way, misquoting Jesus, right? That seems to grab your attention. But that's not the case. So I'm going to hand these out. Okay. I think I need to give you one, right? Who's the interview? No? You got one. Okay. There's an interview. I thought this was really interesting. So Daniel Wallace is the president of the Centers for New Testament Study. He goes around finding manuscripts around the world and taking the high quality digital pictures of them, categorizing them, translating, doing all the good stuff. This is a quote when he went and found some manuscripts in Albania. Everything they went through, it's an art uh, in, in the interview. There's the word. I would recommend reading this on your own time. It's really cool. Next week, I'll be talking about why there's so many English translations um, and other things related to that. Any questions from today? Is this a place you can visit? Um, the center? The center? I don't think it's really a place to visit because, I don't know. That's a good question. I have to look that. My daughter lives yeah. near the DFW, and so that's more for her, and that would be... It, it could very well be. I would not be surprised if they have stuff on display, like some of those manuscripts I showed. Stuff like that. Yeah. Um, okay. Does anybody else need a interview? Aspen, Ed, I'll turn off one more. Here we go. Neil and I can share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My wife doesn't need that. <laughs> you have the original. There you go. And then this is a note page from last week that I did want to hand out with essentially what I went over today. Were you here yeah. last week? Yeah, you were here last week. Wayne yeah. <laughs> was here. Marcus. Marcus. Last week was here. Pastor Donald was not here. <laughs> and uh, Jackie? I will say, um, when I was a new believer reading through the scripture and I saw those footnotes, if this isn't in the original, I did find it annoying because I said, well, why is it in here then? Yeah. It was confusing as a... It's confusing, right? You're like, yeah. well, what does that mean? Why? Yeah. You know, And it opens you up to this whole field of study. Yeah. So I hope that as you guys are reading your Bibles on your own, you come across this footnote, you look into it. What does this say? Does that make a difference? You know, why is this a footnote? Those types of things. You ask yourself those good questions. And you're just more aware of them now. And you can help people who have those questions, too. Um, so I'll pray just real quick, and then I'll let you go. Dear God, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you so much for your word uh, and how you've been able to give it to us and preserve it through the thousands of years and that we can have confidence in it. And so thank you for that, Lord. I pray that everyone here, myself included, would just have a love for your word and study it and just have it uh, lead our lives, Lord, as we seek to uh, live for you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. God.